morning, Christian Life Austin. Who's ready to praise the Lord today? Come on, let's lift him up. We know that he can do all things, amen.
come on, our God is great, amen. There's nothing that he cannot do, that he cannot accomplish in your life. If we just reach out to him right now, if we surrender everything, just lay it at the feet of Jesus right now. Oh, take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire, set me on fire, oh, take all have in these hands and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire come on say this here I am God arms wide
Thank you, Jesus. His presence is here right now. His spirit's moving in this place. Come on, right now as our prayer partners make their way down right now and up into the balcony. We know there's many needs in the house. If you need healing for your body, healing for your mind, healing for your spirit, come down right now and let us pray with you and believe God for healing in your life. If you just need a word from the Lord or some direction for your life, come down right now and let us pray with you and partner with you and believe God for that answer as we continue in our worship right now. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you. Speak to us, Lord. Oh God, oh God, yes. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of Changes what do we see? What do we see?
Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice hanging on every word. Yes, God. Yes, God. You know, there's a story in the book of Acts chapter number 17 and Paul is in the city of Athens, Greece, a place of learning, a place of intellectual growth. And he's talking to these people and he starts to tell them about the goodness and the, the gospel of Jesus and they don't quite understand it. And so they ask to know more. And the Bible tells us, you go read this story, it's an incredible story, but in verse 22 of Acts chapter 17, it says this, then Paul stood up in this meeting and he said, people of Athens, I see that you're religious. For I walked around and looked at your objects of worship. I even found an altar with this inscription that says, to an unknown God. You know, I think this is how our culture is, that a lot of us believe that there's a God, there's a higher power, there's something bigger than us, but we can't actually know him. And here's what Paul says in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples built by human hands and he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything, but rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this for one reason and one reason alone so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him. And here's why, because if you reach out to him, you will find him though he is not far from any of us. Here's what I want you to know here right now. The spirit of the living God is in this house and you can know him. I don't know what you're looking for. I don't know what you need. I don't know what you're hoping for, but Jesus is what you need. Jesus is what you're hoping for. Jesus is what you're looking for. If you believe that all across this place, can you just lift your hands and lift your voices and thank the spirit of the living God that's in this house here today. We thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you're what we're looking for. We can't make it without you. We need you in our lives. We need you in our families. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the spirit of the living God that's in this house. One more time, can we just put our hands together and say thank you, Jesus, that you're here and that you're with me. Hey, what an incredible spirit that's in the house here today. And we're so happy that each and every one of you are here with us at Christian Life Austin. In fact, can you turn to your neighbor right now and just say, have you been working out because you look amazing? morning everybody hey beautiful crowd give your neighbor a great hand clap for being there come on beautiful crowd full house we're fixing to have a bigger house to fill up I'm pumped about it it's hard for me not to talk about it every Sunday we're fixing to have a bigger house to fill up and we're going to fill it because the Lord's promised that if we build it they will come I believe that with all my heart hey I love this session I love this session because when I get through with this session, I'm on the downhill. <laughs> and you know what? I love Oreo cookies, and I look at this session as the cream in the middle. <laughs> Come on now. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm getting off of Bluebell. I really am. I'm getting off Bluebell. I'm eating Oreos now. <laughs> I, I think they're less. I think three Oreo cookies is, is better than three dips of Bluebell ice cream. I may be wrong, but don't tell me if I am. I'm enjoying it. I love you very much. And this is the fourth Sunday of January already, 2020. How many of you still writing 2019 on your checks? Uh-huh. You don't have checks, do you? I don't know. That's old school. Stand to your feet, you're incredible people. I love you very much. This has nothing to do with what I'm going to preach. But I've heard that a three-year-old's voice is louder than 200 adults in a crowded restaurant. I've heard that. I've witnessed that. And when you hear the toilet flush and words, uh-oh, it's already too late. <laughs> and Play-Doh <laughs> and microwave should not be used in the same sentence. It happened in our house. And super glue is forever. Daddy, what? My fingers won't come undone. 
Well, what are we going to do about that? There'll be undone time you get 18, baby. Just hang on. <laughs> and garbage bags do not make good parachutes. Just thought I'd share that with you. That's just some stuff I thought I'd share. It don't have anything to do with life or you today, but it just made me tickle when I got to reading those the other day. I'm going I'm to talk today. I'm going to finish a series that we started first of the year, Emmanuel, God with us. I'm going to talk about the Lord again today, but I'm going to speak on this subject. Take him just as he is. Many of us understand he took us just as we were. We need to take him just as he is today. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to help the pastor. Say, Pastor, preach to me today. Let the word touch my mind. Let it change my mind. Preach to us today. Let the word touch my heart. Let it change my heart. Preach to us today. Let me leave here a better person than what I was when I came in. I love you. You may be seated. Let's roll. The news media lives up to the meaning of their name, news. Each day, some new name dominates the print, the radio, the television, and the web. Names that were popular, though, yesterday draw away many times into oblivion, and they're replaced with new names. However, there's one name that outlasts them all. For nearly two millennia, one and only one, one figure has soothed and disturbed mankind's collective consciousness. Do you know that name I'm talking about? Prior to his arrival on earth, the years were numbered by the reigns of various kings. That's how they decided what year it was. For example, 1 Kings 14 said in the fifth year of King Rehoboam. But since his arrival, time is counted backwards and forward from the supposed year of his birth, B.C.A.D. Peter Marshall, chaplain of the U.S. Senate, once said, There has been no other name who has dominated history. No other influence has so profoundly affected human life. No other birthday is so widely observed. No other teachings so much discussed. If no one else have, uh, of no one else have so many books been written to the cause of no other leader have so many followers given their lives. Christianity, the faith once called the way, is founded on a person, not a philosophy, not merely obeying the golden rule, not just loving your neighbor or giving to others, not about trying to be good. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. See, the gospel, folks, isn't just history. It is his story. His unfolding drama of redemption is told in four acts. Act one, God created mankind. Aren't you glad he made us? Act two, mankind fell. That's sad. Act three, God descended to reach mankind. He came as Emmanuel, God with us. In act four, God ascended to fill mankind with his spirit. And oh yes, the epilogue, act five. He's coming again. Everybody say God with us. That's what we taught the first Sunday. God with us is greater than Ichabod, God departing. Last Sunday or two Sundays ago, we talked about miracles happen. The first miracle, turning water into wine. He wanted you to know, he wanted you to know that everybody could have the miracle of Jesus in your life. And then last week, we talked about the last chapter first. The disciples, Peter, James, and John, got a glimpse on the Mount of Transfiguration of the Lord garment illuminated himself and realizing he was more than just a prophet like Elijah. He was more than a lawgiver like Moses. He was the Messiah. He was Christ, the anointed one. And today we're going to continue and finish this series up and we're going to preach on take him just as he is. Now we're going to read from Mark chapter four today, a few verses four and one. It's on the screen. He began again to teach by the seaside and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. He had him a little amphitheater there. Verse 33 said, And with many such parables spake he the word to them, as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all the things to his disciples. He told them what those parables really meant. And on the same day, 
when the even was come, he saith unto them, let's pass over unto the other side. I love when Jesus says that. Let's go over. Let's get over something to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, it's on the screen, they took him even as he was, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. In the very first verse of this chapter, the setting shows Jesus teaching. He's never really particular about his pulpit or his setting. Everything does not have to be just right. He doesn't have to have the temperature right, the band playing right, in the right atmosphere, in the right environment. Here we find he's out on a boat. The people are along the shore, and he's teaching them. First, let me say this. Jesus will meet you where you are. It doesn't matter where you are today. He'll meet you at an altar. He'll meet you at a well. He'll meet you in a field. He'll meet you in the sea. He'll meet you at a house. He'll meet you on a mountain. He'll meet you in a valley. Yeah, he's met a lot of people in prison. He'll meet you. We do not serve, God, uh, serve a God who is neither interested nor concerned with where we are. Our God knows, our God cares, and our God understands. And my God offers to every man and woman the same deal. Everybody gets the same deal. And it goes like this. If you, sir, if you, ma'am, ever decide that you're tired of your life as you know it, if you ever decide it's time for a change, and you open up your heart to me and turn your life over to me, then your part of the initial journey is over, and I will step in then, and I will do the rest. No need in trying to climb to where I am or to reach down to my depths. Just stop where you are and say, Lord, I need you, and I want you. Then I'll step off my throne, and I will come down from the heights. And I will come up from the depths and I will meet you where you are. Remember, our relationship will begin at your house. At your house. Everybody say, my relationship with the Lord begins at my house. At my house. My house. I never find in Scripture where Jesus said, if you will come to my house and be my guest then I'll be your God. As a matter of fact, he said it this way in Matthew 8. He said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In other words, I don't have a home unless you give me one in your heart. In fact, I inhabit, I dwell on the praise of people. That's my home. But I do find in Scripture where he knocks on the door in Revelation 3 and 20, and he will come in if you will invite him. And he will sup with you. He'll take your stuff that you don't want. He'll take that and drink it. And then he'll let you sup with him. He'll give you the joy and the peace and the happiness that you're looking for in life. And I do find many references to Jesus eating in homes of questionable characters, unsavory people, even people of ill repute. You know why? Because they invited him. When you invite him, he'll always come to where you are. I think we ought to clap for that because that's the Jesus I'm preaching about today. He'll come where you are. Then when even came, the Bible said, he said to his disciples, just go over to the other side. Let me stop and say, what a joy to see a full house first of the year. You're doing the right thing by showing up at church. You're getting your year started. You're getting this party with Jesus started right. You're in the house of God. So leaving the crowd behind, they took him along in the boat. The Bible said there were also other boats. Let me detour here and try to explain something to anyone here who may have this question. We know after the fact, because we've read the back of this book, we've read this chapter, between this side of the bank to the other side of the lake, there's going to come a storm. Everybody say a storm. We have read the rest of the story, and we know what's going to happen. A storm's going to rise. Winds are going to blow. Waves are going to crash. People are going to panic. They're going to trip all over themselves and say words they wish they hadn't said. And they're going to try everything possible to remedy the situation. We also know that the disciples will remember that Jesus is in the hinder part of the boat asleep. And they'll run and wake him and he will calm the storm. We already know that. But there are two parts of this whole scenario and story we often overlook. Part number one, 
There were other boats following along that day. Everybody say other boats. You got to get this. See, it's the same lake. It's the same day. Several boats together in the same storm. Same lake, same day, same storm, several boats. My point is this. Everybody in this house is going to face storms. Boy, you didn't like that, did you? Oh, pastor preached to us sweet and pretty. You're going to have a storm in your life. Storms are going to come. When it rains on your house, it's probably going to rain on mine. It rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. When the price of eggs and gas goes up and it affects you, it's going to affect me. The horrible storm did not choose a particular boat on this on which to happen. The storm happened because storms happen. Say it with me. Storms happen. Man that's born of woman is but a few days and full of trouble. Everybody has storms. And everybody initially reacts the same way. But there is a major distinction between this boat and all the others. One boat chose to take Jesus along on the boat. Here's what I want to preach today. Getting started in this new year, you need to surrender right now today and say, Lord, I need a fresh start. I've tried to run my rig all over the, the, the lakes in life, and I can't do it by myself. Would you get on my boat with me this year? It doesn't matter if you go to sleep in the hinder part of my ship. Knowing I got you on this boat makes all the difference in the world because we can get to the other side when I have you in my life. Hallelujah. The good news is that we're not in control. Jesus is. We must remember in the storms of life and through all the temptations we face, the Lord is present and God is in control. Now, this, this next part, this next part's not really in my sermon. It's just something I thought about the other day. And I thought, you know, if I feel good about it, I'm going I'm to say something about it. And I feel good about it, say it to you. Self thoughts. These are self thoughts, not deep thoughts with Jack Handy, but self thoughts with Pastor Rex. Okay? Some of you got it. Jesus is on the boat, he's in the hinder part of the ship, not the front. He's asleep. And they go down and they wake him up and said, Master careth not that we perish. And they realized that he wasn't asleep just because he was dead tired. He had planned to go to sleep. He had brought a pillow. <laughs> this was a planned now. Jesus is planned sometime is that he trusts you enough in the storm that he'll bring a pillow on board with him and say, I'm going to rest because in just a little while, we're going to land over here at this other place and there's a man going to come screaming out of a, out of a graveyard that's got a bunch of spirits in him and I'm going to have to cast those spirits out and i got to trust in my people on this boat that they will trust me that I'm on this boat and I can take a nap with a pillow. Somebody help me preach right now. You don't have to have Jesus at front of the boat all the time and saying, I'm the king of the world. He can be on your boat and be taking a nap. Let him rest in your life. Just get him on board. Get him on board. Get him on board. That's all I got to say about that. The message Jesus presents to us is today is born out in a stress, recent stress management survey. Experts say that only 2% of our worrying time is spent on things that might actually be helped by worrying. 2%. <laughs> you know what the opposite of praise is in the Old Testament? It's a Hebrew word that means to worry. You either worry or you worship. You either fret or you praise. Come on now. And, and the other 98% of our worry and time is spent as follows. Here it is. 40% is spent worrying about things that never happen. Nobody's done that here. I know that. 35% is spent worrying about things that cannot be changed. Hello. 
15% is worrying about things that turn out better than expected. And 8% is spent worrying about things that are so petty that they don't even matter. <laughs> I just did this this morning, first service. I just remembered a song. Do, 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 That's an old song, but there's a fresher one that's come out that a man sang. He said, because I'm happy. <laughs> Clap your hands if you believe that something is the roof and the roof and all. <laughs> Somebody needs to get happy understanding that Jesus will get on your boat and take you to the other side. Hallelujah. I shouldn't be doing that. I'm too old for that. <laughs> Job challenges. He said, acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Job went through hell on this earth, but he said, acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. I read a story about a, an old prospector in Colorado that didn't have any next of kin except a nephew. He had no family himself. He never was married. And he had a miser buddy. And they were prospecting in Colorado. And he had lived in an old shack that had a table and a chair and had a bed and an old rusty bed, bed frame and, and a mattress. And, and then, he, then he had this other chair that he relaxed in. And, and he, had, he had this place where he could pour water and he could drain the water out into a bucket and throw it out. His restroom was outside. And he wrote his nephew in Chicago. He said, when I die... When you get notification, you're in my will. I want you to come and everything in the house is yours. Take whatever you want. It's yours. Nobody else. But he said, when you get through, I want my, I want my buddy to take this house because he doesn't have a place to stay. And he's been living in the, in the mines and, and I want him to have a place to stay. And so when the old man died, the cousin came or the nephew came from Chicago and went in the house and they saw some pictures. They saw this old rustic stuff and they said, there's nothing here worthwhile. And so they loaded up the pictures and they took some possessions and they got in their car and they were driving out. And as they were driving out, they met this old miser with an old mule coming up toward the house. And they stopped and said, are you his friend? He said, yes, I am. They said, well, we've got everything we want and need out of the house. You go ahead and it's yours. Go live in it. He said, thank you. He goes in the house and he looks out the window to make sure they're gone. And he goes over to the table and moves it. And he moves three boards in the floor and starts pulling out bags of gold. Enough, the story said, to build some big old places in Las Vegas. Gold, golden buildings. And he went over to the window and he looked out the window and he said, they should have got to know him better. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you think you're broke. You think you're busted and disgusted and that God can't come to where you are. The devil is a liar and the father of all lies. Get him on your boat. Throw a pillow to him. Let him have some pre-planned sleep, premeditated sleep, and let him understand that you've got him and you're going to have confidence. You know him as your Savior and your Lord and your King. Come on, clap your hands real big. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The second overlooked point in this great story is they took Jesus along just as he was. I want to speak about this point today. Jesus said, I would like to be your travel companion. I'd like to be the one to get you to the other side. They said, go with us and we'll take you just as you are. I love that. My question today is, can you take him as he is? He has no false pretenses. He doesn't do hypocrisy real well. What you see is what you get with him. Can you take him as he is? It could mean a difference in how you handle the storm and getting to the other side. Can I brag on Jesus a little bit today? Yes. Y'all mind if I brag on him a little bit? This is the last Sunday. Next Sunday we're starting a brand new series. But this whole month I've been wanting to talk about and brag on the Messiah, Jesus Christ. His is the voice. 
His is the name, and His is the power. Let me just read some things that I wrote down and I want to share it with you. Everybody say, His is the voice. His is the voice that calls over a stormy sea and puts the waves to sleep. His is the voice that speaks to the little, and it becomes much. His is the voice that bids us to step from the comfortable into the miraculous. His is the voice that rebukes indecision while encouraging trust. His is the voice that teaches us how to live, that empowers us to live what he teaches. His is the voice. His is the voice of the shepherd that knows his sheep by name. His is the voice of the physician who says You're, you are healed. His is the voice of the judge who says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. His is the voice of a Savior who cries, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. His is the voice of the burden bearer who says, I will give you rest. His is the voice. His is the voice that speaks from his word. His is the voice that speaks from mankind's conscience. His is the voice that speaks to us from his handiwork. His is the voice that speaks to us from the needs of others asking for cold water. His is the voice that speaks to a person filled with his spirit. His is the voice. Paul said that the Lord himself would descend with heaven, from heaven with a shout. That's his voice. His is the voice that even the dead can hear. His is the voice that awakens those who sleep in Christ. He's the voice that gives life to our dearly departed. And his is the voice that will summon all of us to the sky. His is the voice that speaks to all of us today. You want to get that on your boat. You want to get him with you. Let him take you to the other side. Let me preach a little more. Everybody said his is the name. His is the name spoken by Gabriel to Mary and Joseph. His is the name worshipped by angels in Bethlehem's night sky. His is the name revered by shepherds and wise men alike. His is the name adored by Anna and Simeon at the temple. His is the name. His is the name that brought a ray of light to a blind Bartimaeus. His is the name that caused the gathering devils to pack their bags and run to the pigs. His is the name that invited opposition or adoration, but never indifference. His is the name that heralded the dawn of a new day. His is the name. His is the name when call brings salvation. His is the name that we believed on for the sick brings healing. His is the name when confessed in times of struggle brings an answer. When worship brings security. His is the name. Many years ago, Shakespeare said, what's in a name? What's in in the name of Jesus, it all depends on who you are and what you do. To the architect, he's the chief cornerstone. To the banker, he's the baker, he's the living bread. To the banker, he's a name that's a hidden treasure. To the biologist, his name is life. To the builder, his name is a sure foundation. To a doctor, his name is a great physician. His is the name. To a farmer, his, uh, his name is the Lord of the harvest. To a florist, he's the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. To the geologist, his name is the rock of ages. To the judge, his name is the righteous judge. To the jeweler, he's the pearl of great price. To, to, to the lawyer, his name is wonderful counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, his is the name. To a news reporter, his name is good news. To the optometrist, his name is the light of the world. To the philanthropist, his name is the unspeakable gift. To the philosopher, his name is the wisdom of God. And to a preacher, he's the living word. And to a sculpture, he's a living stone. His name, to his, his is the name. To the servant, his name is a good master. To the statesman, his name is desire of all nations. To the student, his name is truth. And to the traveler, his name is the living way. And to the sinner, his name is savior. And to the worshiper, his name is the name above every name. His name, the name of Jesus Christ. Clap your hands and rejoice to that right now. It's been 20 centuries since mankind first heard that name. The name of Jesus is old, but as fresh as the morning dew. We still dedicate our children calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 4 said there's salvation in no other name except Jesus Christ. We pray over our marriages invoking the name at night. And when the clock of life chimes its final notes, we whisper with dying breath that precious name, Jesus. Everybody say his voice. Everybody say his name. Now say his power. His is the power to make the blind to see and the lame to walk. His is the power to heal the hurting and the heart sick. His is the power to appear to the disillusioned and the discouraged. His is the power to find the lost and the wounded. His is the power to convict and convince. 
His is the power to rebuke and reprove. His is the power to bless and to curse. His is the power to eliminate, illuminate the darkness. His is the power to bring you from confusion to understanding, to lead you from a prison cell to freedom, to draw you from doubt's dungeon into faith, to usher you from a closet of prayer into the throne room of, prayer, of worship. His is the power. When Jesus taught us to pray, he instructed us to close with the words, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A kingdom requires a king. A king requires power. And his is the power and his kingdom is everlasting and of his kingdom there will be no end amen amen his is the power over creation thou hast made heaven and earth with thy great power jeremiah said he's the power over the elements which by his strength sets fast the mountains who steals the noise of the sea. His is the power over the nations. The heathen raged and the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. His is the power over wickedness. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Jesus is able to keep you from falling. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all. He's able to cure the situation. He's able to bring wisdom because his is the power. Say it with me. It's his voice. It's his name. And it's his power. And guess what? You can have him on your boat. Come on, get him on your boat. Let's get him on our boat in January this year. Come on. Let's don't wait till August when we run into some hot problems and some deep situations. Get him on your boat right now. Come on, clap your hands and say, I want you on my rig, Jesus. I want you. I want you. Woo. Man, I wrote so much, I nearly ran out of breath there. Don't take him as you think he, or he is or as you think he should be. Some folks can't take him as he is because they want to do away with some things. I'm getting close to a close. They want to take away his cross. They want Jesus light. They want Jesus but not the cross. They want to take away his thorns and his nail prints and his scarred back and his pierced side. They want to do away with self-sacrifice. They want to lighten up on the servanthood. They want to toss out self-denial. But Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Can I tell you, when you decide to follow Jesus, it's the greatest and the easiest life you'll ever have. When you decide to play around with Jesus, it's the toughest life you'll ever live. Because a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. And when you try to hold on to him and hold on to the world, it just won't work. Why don't you let go of something and grab a hold of something that's really genuine and real. Get him on your boat and let's go to the other side. The old hymn says, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bids me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. Let me turn a coin and sing from the point of view of him. Just as I am, just as you see, can you take me now? Can you live for me? With all my scars and my cross to bear, will you come, O oh child, will you come? Can you come to him just as he is? See, some people don't take away from him. They add opinions and ideologies and traits to him. That's not right, friend. You can't add anything to him. If I was God, I'd be tired of me, but you're not God, so take him as he is. If I was God, I would make me prove myself, earn his respect, earn his grace. No, 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 you're wrong. John 3 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. Yeah. And I find in the book of Revelation that if any man takes words away from this book, God will take his name out of the book. And if any man adds anything to this book, God will add, him to the, add the plagues to him described in the book. Take the limits off of your human thinking of God and let God be who God needs to be yes. in your life. Yes. It's called surrender. Randy, if you'll help me. It's called surrender. It's called surrender. Let God be God. Let God be God. I was saved as a young boy. The baptism of the Holy Spirit came into my life a few years later. I was baptized as a baby, seven years old. I was baptized at seven. And I came up clawing because I was afraid of somebody holding me under. I came up grabbing. And you know what? I've laughed about that. I've laughed about it because when that pastor put me under that water, 
I went nuts, <laughs> literally nuts. And I grabbed his arm and I pulled myself up and he just said, you know what? I'm going to hold you down a little longer, little boy. <laughs> and I came up sputtering. I came up sputtering. And it was when I was preaching a long time later that God kind of dropped something in my heart. He said, I like the way you want to come out of the water and get on with life. I didn't think anything bad about it, son. I loved your get up spirit. You wasn't going to let anybody hold you down long. The pastor was mean, and he held me down. If I ever baptize you, I'm going to baptize you and get you up right now because I believe Jesus has something so great for you. And if you've never, if you've never been water baptized, you need to do that. You know what? If you don't want to wait for the next baptism, <laughs> Just call me. Come on to the church. We'll fill the water pot for you. We'll fill up the baptistry just for you because we want you to fill your heart and get Jesus on board your life. Get him on board your life. Get him on board. Get him on your vessel and let him take you to the other side. Let's don't play this year. Let's have church in our own home. Let's have church in our own life. Let's have church in our family. Let's let God be God in all that we do. Come on, clap your hands real big for that. Will you stand? Mark Twain and a friend walked outside one day in the rain. And the friend said, you think it's going to stop, Mark? You think this rain's going to stop? And Twain looked at him and he said, it always does. You hear me. There's not anything that you go through in life that when you have Jesus on board, that he won't stand up and rebuke the wind and calm the waves in your life. He may not stop the storm, but he'll steal the soul because that's what he does. It doesn't always last because the Lord put a bow in the cloud a long time ago and said, there won't be any more storms like this. Your storms that come always end. Get Jesus on board. Get Jesus on board. Let him take you to the other side of 2020. Know that I love you. I love you a bunch. Now bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm not giving a saved or lost call today. I'm giving a fresh start call today. It's the first of the year. And I'd like for those that would like to just have a fresh beginning, a fresh start. we got about five minutes. Don't leave. Please don't leave. It's not church time to be dismissed yet. I'm early. I'm a good pastor. I'm early. I want you to come if you want a fresh start today. We had about 60 in the first service. Come on down here right now. Pastor, I just need to get Jesus on board my vessel. I need to start this year the right way. Would you come right now? Would you step out right now? Who'll be the first to start the flow? Here they come. Come on right now. Come on right now. Come on. Here they come. Here they come. Come on right now. In the name of the Lord. Let's give them all a great hand as they come here today. Let's give everybody a great hand. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. This takes courage to step out in front of 600, 650, 700 people. It takes courage. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, guys. That's beautiful. Woo. Hallelujah, I'm pumped, I'm excited, I'm excited. I'm thrilled, here they come, come on. Come on, get over here in the middle. Come on, it's all right, you stay there, you stay there. There's plenty of room, that's fine, come on. Come on, here they come. They're coming out of the balcony. We're gonna wait a little longer. We're gonna wait. Everybody say, Pastor, I want a fresh start today. I want to start 2020 with Jesus in my boat. I want him to take me to the other side. I want the other side to be accomplished this year in my life. There's no reason why he won't do that because he loves you. Raise your hands now. Raise your hands. I want you in the audience to raise your hands and bless these people as we pray. Say, Dear Father, I love you today and I thank you because Pastor told me I could have a brand new start in my life today. God, get on my boat. Come into my life. Let me take you just as you are. Let me embrace the cross. 
Let me embrace your pain. Let me embrace the fact that you died for me. Let me embrace the fact that you were buried for me. Let me embrace the fact that you rose for me. Let me embrace the fact that you ascended for me. And let me embrace the fact that you're coming back for me. I want you in my life in 2020. Let me have a brand new beginning today. Amen. Today. In Jesus' name. Come on, signature it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now turn around and face the audience. Turn around. Face the audience. Give them a great hand. Come on. Looky here. Looky here. Give them a great hand. When I was a kid, don't leave. When I was a kid, I was in the altar every Sunday. I wanted another fresh start. Many of you know what I'm talking about. We need people to have new beginnings at CLC this year. We need people to have fresh beginnings and fresh starts. The world wants to pull us down and encumber us, but Jesus wants to lift us and lighten our load. He is that kind of Savior. I love you. Go with the Lord today. I bless this congregation in the name of the Lord. May the face of God shine on you. May His grace be a part of your day. May you be blessed in your comings and going. May you be blessed in the city and in the country. May you be blessed on your job and in your home. May you be blessed in your school and in your car. May you be blessed in all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.